Hi everyone, so today we're going to have a pretty big discussion and it's mostly going to revolve around complex numbers, polynomials and the argument plane. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction to what complex numbers are, how you can represent them on the argument plane. You know, I'm going to define certain quantities as the modulus of a complex number, something that you might have seen before. But uh, mostly once we're, once we're done with the basics, we're going to discuss the interesting things, right? We're going to look at how we can analyze certain things on the argument plane, the geometry of complex numbers and involving vectors in the complex plane as well. So quite a bit of discussion is going to be about vectors as well. So this is going to be a pretty interesting video and let's just get right into it. This is the problem number 14 from the AIME in 2012. And in this video, I'm going to talk about what complex numbers are, what the modulus of a complex number is, you know, the roots of the polynomials, Vieta's relations, of course, and the argument plane. Then I have three solutions. First is a rough solution that I'm just going to get to the answer in like a few minutes. It's an easy solution. It's like a quick solution, you know, a cheat solution. You can call it that. Then we have an algebraic solution, a little bit more formal. And then we have the most beautiful, the geometric solutions. It's really amazing if you're able to visualize it quite well. Then we have an interesting observation and we also have book sessions with National Maths Olympiads. And at the end, obviously, we have a challenge problem as well. So quite a long discussion, as you can see over here with the element of vectors involved as well. This video is sponsored by Chinta.com. Since 2010, Chinta has trained thousands of students from all around the world in mathematical olympiads, physics olympiads, computer science and informatics olympiads, ISI CMI entrances, and research projects for school and college students. Okay, um, so before we really dive you know, into this, let me just uh, give you some brief introduction of a complex number. So any complex number Z can be represented as A plus B I, where A and B are real numbers. Now, the real part of this complex number Z is obviously A, as that is a purely real part of it. And the imaginary part of it is B, that's a purely imaginary part of it. And the complex number is obviously some of its real and imaginary components. So A plus B I is the general representation of any particular complex number. Now, what's this argument plane? So, for example, on the normal coordinate axis, you know, you have the x-axis, you have the y-axis, and then you can plot any point 1, 1 on it so that the x-coordinate is 1 and y-coordinate is 1. It's as simple as that. And uh, we've seen that many times before. But now, if I asked you how do you plot this complex number on, um, on, on, on like two axes like these, so to do that, we have this concept of an argument plane. So on the argument plane, we have a real axis and a complex axis. I'll denote that by R and C. And, you know, similarly, any point over here can have the coordinates, let's say A comma B. And let me denote the complex number as Z. So Z here will be A plus B I as the distance. This distance is going to be A, right? And this, this coordinate is obviously going to be A comma zero. And this is obviously going to be 0 comma B. So it's B on the complex scale, on the complex axis, and A on the real axis. So the complex number is defined as A plus B I. Now this, obviously, the perpendicular distance is B. Now, now this this quantity called as the modulus of a complex number. And we write that as like this, the modulus of Z. And modulus of Z is nothing but the distance from the origin to the complex number Z. So this thing is going to be defined as the modulus of complex number z and it's really easy to see that modulus of complex number z whole square is equal to a square plus b square from pythagoras theorem because this is 90 degree so the modulus is nothing but square root of a square plus b square so in general for any complex number z that can be represented as a plus b i the modulus is given by a square root of a square plus b square so that's a little bit of complex numbers that you should be knowing before we jump into this problem Okay, so now let's just read it and uh, there's quite a bit to unravel over here. So let's get into it. Now the complex numbers A, B and C are zeros of this given polynomial. So let me just write that down. We have given to us a polynomial P of Z is equal to Z cube plus QZ plus R, right? Something like this. Z cube plus QZ plus R. And they've also given to us that A, B and C are roots of this. Uh, let me just demonstrate that as A, B, C. Let me just draw this stick diagram. So A, B, and C are roots of this uh, given polynomial. It's a complex polynomial. And they've given us this condition. The you know, sum of squares of the modulus is 250, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't matter right now. And the points corresponding to A, B, and C in the complex plane are vertices of a right angle triangle with hypotenuse H. 
find eighth square so basically they've given to us a couple of conditions the first thing is that sum of squares of the modulus is 250 and the second thing that we can kind of deduce from this is a plus b plus c is equal to zero now clear to see that's a direct consequence of v eta oscillations because if you look at this polynomial there is no term with z squared or in other words the coefficient of z squared is zero and from Vieta's translation, if that is the case, then sum of the roots is clearly equal to zero. Right? Direct consequence of Vieta's translations, Vieta's formula. So we have this two couple of conditions, a plus b plus c is equal to zero, and sum of the scores of the modulus of these three complex numbers, which is 250. And they've told us that these three points, that these three numbers, a, b, and c, correspond to the vertices of a right angle triangle. Right? So maybe let's just try and plot that on the complex plane. Right? Let's just make a rough, rough figure. Is this a rough diagram? Like, like I said, this is the rough solution of the cheat solution that we're going to discuss first. So let the point A be equal to 2. You know, it, it, it's perfectly fine. It, let, let it be purely a real number. Let it be purely on the uh, on, on the real scale, on the argon plane, which is perfectly fine. Now, let's say the second complex number is somewhere here and third is somewhere here. Let's say this is negative 1 plus 3i. And let's say this is negative 1 minus 3i. Let me just, you know, connect these three points. Now, it's clear to see that this is a right angle triangle. How? Well, this is right angle. Right. And um, so let's say this is A, let's say this is B, and let's say this is C. So over here, A plus B plus C would be 2 plus negative 1 plus 3i plus negative 1 minus 3i. And that's clearly equal to 0. But modulus of A squared is clearly 4. What is B? b is negative 1 plus 3i so the modulus of b whole squared would be 1 plus 9 remember it is square root of a squared plus b squared but when you square it you get a squared plus b squared right so therefore modulus of b squared is equal to 10 and similarly the modulus of c squared is also equal to 10 therefore here modulus of a squared plus modulus of b squared plus modulus of c squared is actually equal to 24 but in the question they wanted it to be 3 250 right in the question, they wanted to be 250. What does this mean? That means the triangle that I've drawn over here, like I said, it's a rough figure. The triangle that I've drawn over here is not the triangle that they are telling us in the question. Right? That means over here, because the sum of the squares of the models is 24, it is not the correct triangle. The correct triangle would be, in a way, scaled up. Right? It'll be some somewhat larger than this. It'll be a, a lot bigger than this. It's going to be, um, it's going to be completely blown up compared to this. It's going to be such that sum of squares of the moduli are 250. But this is a rough figure. And what you need to understand is that this will be the hypotenuse. You know, this, this vertical distance, this will be the hypotenuse, which is the side opposite to the 90 degree angle. Right now, hypotenuse is clear to see that it is equal to 6i, right? And um, the square of the modulus would be clearly 36. Now, there's an interesting observation. The square of the modulus is equal to 36. Now, do you see something? Do you notice some similarity between these two numbers, 24 and 36? Well, 36 is 50% more than 24. So my hypothesis is that 8 square will always be 50% more than these sum of squares of the modulus. So A squared plus B squared plus C squared. And then you take the modulus. So 8 squared is always going to be 50% more than these quantities. That is actually true. And the reason why is it true, it will become more clear when you talk about the algebraic solution, but you know, what you can maybe do is maybe you can figure out certain more triangles. Like for example, I took, I really took three random points, you know, two and these two, I really took three random points. You should, can also take three random points so that they sum to zero and sum of squares of the modulus, let it be anything, let it be anything. And, and what you'll realize is that no matter what these values of A, B and C are so that they sum to zero, the square of the hypotenuse always, always, always be 50% more than the sum of square of these uh, modulus quantities right and kind of the rough reason for that is when you blow this up when you blow this up the ratio of b and c are actually going to be the same so effectively they're satisfying the pythagorean identity right so you are really can only control one of them because the other one of them is restricted to do the relation of the pythagoras identity but um, anyways the idea is that the modulus of the square of h hypotenuse square will always be 50 percent more than this and you can try out certain other triangles i'd recommend you to do that and when you do that, you'll always, always, always notice that a squared is all 50% more than whatever you get for a squared plus b squared plus c squared. So therefore, in our question, we had a squared plus b squared plus c squared is equal to 250. 
Now, obviously, 8 square is going to be 50% more than this. So 250 plus 50% more than that. And that's going to be 250 plus this becomes 125. And 8 square is 375. And then you're done. So if this small little observation clicks to you in the exam hall, that when you blow this triangle up, such that you know you get this uh, 250 when you blow this triangle up the triangle that i made in the figure when you blow it up h square will still be 50 percent more than that and you can get the answer now aime is not a subjective exam it's something similar to the iqm you know you just input an integer value and that's pretty much it that's pretty much aib like the iqm you don't have to provide a subjective reasoning for it like in more or usm or any of these contests but this question could have very well come on a subjective exam, you know, maybe British Math Olympia or, or any subjective exam for that matter. And if you do this in a subjective exam, you're probably gonna get zero for it <laughs> or minimum marks, like one mark at the very best. Okay, so you're gonna have to provide some kind of, you know, logical argument and not just that it's gonna blow up and it's somehow gonna be 50% more. Okay. Now for that argument and to kind of understand better why this is actually 50% we're gonna look at the algebraic solution, right? Which is in a way a brute force solution, I guess. Because it's really involving vectors and stuff like that. So we have a right angle triangle, like they said in the given question. And uh, A, B, and C correspond to this vertices. Now, if I involve vectors over here, vectors. Now there's this given condition that A plus B plus C is equal to zero. So if I donate, if I like uh, denote this by A, this by B and this by C, it's clear to see that A plus B plus C is equal to zero by symmetry. You know, this, we have this vector and uh, it's, it's, it's symmetrical structure, 120 degrees. So their summation is zero. Now, this is obviously 90 degree. And we have this right angle triangle. Now by a vector addition, I can state that this side is A minus B. This side is B minus C and this side is A minus C. You know, clear to see by vector addition or rather by vector subtraction. Okay. Now, if you actually notice this side B minus C, if I just rotate this by 90 degree and scale it, I'm going to get A minus B, right? This side B minus C, I'm just going to rotate it counterclockwise by an angle 90 degree and scale it by a factor of, let's say, K, I'll get A minus B. So essentially, essentially, I take B minus C, I took B minus C, I rotated it counterclockwise by 90 degree, that's multiplication by I, and then I scaled it by a factor of K and I got A minus B. Essentially, just a little bit of vectors over here. Right. Okay, great. So we have this, we have this really nice little condition that a minus B is actually equal to K times I times C minus B. And actually this will actually be C minus B. I made a little bit of a mistake over there. So C minus B and this again becomes C minus B. Okay, great. So yeah, a minus B is equal to K I times C minus. It should look something like this. Okay, great. Now if this condition a plus b plus c is equal to zero, so a is equal to negative b negative c. If I plug that in over here, I'll get negative 2b negative c is equal to ki times c minus b. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all terms with b common. So I'll get negative 2 plus ki. And then on the right hand side, I'll take all terms with c common. And I'll get 1 plus ki. Right, a little bit of simplification. So what I can see is b by c is actually equal to 1 plus ki divided by negative 2 plus k. Now, here's the interesting thing. Here's the interesting thing. We have the ratio. Now, if you remember what I was talking about earlier, the 50%, the, the, that 50 percent constant is going to be the same. 8 square will always be 50 percent more. And that is in a way related to, because over here, if you see this, b by c is actually a constant. For a given value of k, b by c is going to be a constant. Right? Now, because this ratio is constant, 8 square will always be 50 percent more, no matter what triangle you consider in the argument plane. But okay, let's see that a little bit more clearly. So I can write B as a complex number omega times 1 plus ki. And similarly, I can write C as a complex number omega, the same complex number omega times negative 2 plus ki. So the ratio of these two quantities is as desired. Okay, now A is obviously negative B negative C. So if you calculate that, you'll get omega times 1 minus 2 ki. Now over here, it's clear to see that A plus B plus C is equal to 0. You can just add these up and they uh, sum to 0. So now, modulus of a square plus modulus of b square plus modulus of c square, this quantity will be modulus of omega square times 6k square plus 6. You can just calculate this out. So in a way, 250 is equal to 6 times omega squared times k squared plus 1. Or in other words, I can write omega squared 
times k squared plus 1 is actually equal to 250 by 6. And let's just maybe call that as equation number 1. I hope I haven't labeled anything else as equation number 1. But uh, okay, anyways. So now, what was the hypotenuse? If you look at the diagram, the hypotenuse is a minus c, right? Hypotenuse is a minus c. Now, we don't know the value of a, we know the value of c. So we can calculate out the value of the hypotenuse, right? And hypotenuse is actually like a minus c. So the square of the hypotenuse, and I take the modulus would be modulus of a minus c whole squared, right? And um, h is actually omega times 3 minus 3ki. You can just compute this by subtraction of those two quantities. So modulus of h squared will be omega squared times this becomes 9 plus 9k squared, right? Something like this. So modulus of h squared becomes 9 times modulus of omega squared times k squared plus 1. But if you actually notice from equation number one, this quantity, this quantity was 250 by 6. So hypotenuse square is 9 times 250 by 6. So this becomes um, 125. And um, or rather I should do it like this. This becomes 3. This becomes 2. And then you have this and this cancel. So we get 375. So hypotenuse square is 375. So that was essentially my point, right? No matter what the value of a square plus b square plus c square is, h square will always be 15% more than that. And it's really due to the reasoning that uh, b by c is actually a constant. And b square plus c square need to be a squared, right? So you really can only fix one of these a comma b comma c and the others have to in a way follow. And uh, that's why it's really not mattering what uh, what these actual values they are taking. h square will always, always, always be 50% more than whatever value it has but okay these two solutions were nice the first one gave you the answer in like two three minutes the second one was a little bit more formal description about it a little bit of algebraic solution but the third solution is the best one of them all and right, we're going to look at a geometric solution but before we really dive into that i want to tell you about a nice little fact about parallelograms and you'll see why this is relevant because parallelograms you know i'm talking about vectors i'm talking about the argon plane how did parallelogram come into here Right? Well, apart from the fact that uh, there's a vector addition, parallelogram law of vector addition, we'll see about that later. So let's say you have this parallelogram and let's say the sides are A and B. Now, from the property of the parallelogram, opposite sides are equal. So again, this becomes A, this becomes a B. Now, from the parallelogram law of vector addition, we know that this side, which you call as the major diagonal, is equal to A plus B or A vector plus B vector. I'm just ignoring the vector notation, but you get the idea, right? Similarly, this other diagonal, which we call the minor diagonal, is actually A minus B. And you can really see this via vector addition. Okay. Now, if you actually notice, uh, D1 squared plus D2 squared, where D is the diagonal. So I'm talking about the sum of squares of the diagonals. This will be A plus B whole square plus A minus B whole square. And you just compute this, you get 2 times A squared plus B squared. In a way, the sum of squares of the diagonals is equal to 2 times A squared plus B squared. Now, if you actually notice the sum of squares of the sides, a squared plus a squared is 2a squared, b squared plus b squared is 2b squared. So you get 2a squared plus b squared. Therefore, sum of squares of sides, sum of squares of sides is equal to sum of squares of diagonals in a parallelogram. Right? This is a very interesting fact about parallelograms. You might have heard about this, you might not have heard about this. Um, but the sum of squares of the diagonals is equal to sum of squares of the set, and it's really easy to see from, from vector notation, right, why this happens. Okay, um, so now using that, we're gonna do a little bit of geometry over here, right, and I want you to put on your visualization hat so that uh, you are able to see this a little bit better. Okay, so let's just draw a right angle triangle that we had. So we have this right angle triangle over here, right, and again, let me just denote the vectors like we did before, right? So we had this A over here and we had this B over here. We have this C, A plus C plus C is equal to zero, vector addition, clear to see. Now I'm going to make a few parallelograms, right? This is obviously 90 degree. Now let's make a few parallelograms. So the first one is going to be this one. Let me just maybe try and make my diagram a little better, right? Okay, something like this. So this is one parallelogram, right? Do you see it? Let me just label the points, maybe A, B, C, and D. 
So this is our first parallelogram. Okay, let's just maybe try and make another one. So let's say this is our second one. Something like this. Okay. So B, C, let's say E and F. This is a second parallelogram. And let's also make our third parallelogram, which is, let's say, how will it look? It'll look something like this, I guess. And let me just take a different color, maybe. Let's take, what shall we take? Let's take red. Okay. So this becomes something like this. Okay. So A, B, F, and G. So we have three parallelograms, right? A, B, C, D. This is a parallelogram. Then we have B, F, E, C. A, B, C, D. B, F, E, C. This is the second parallelogram. And a third is A, G, F, B. So we have three parallelograms. And what's amazing about this is here we're going to use the simple fact that sum of squares of the sides is actually the sum of squares of the diagonals. Now, let me just mark some things, right? Let's say this perpendicular height is P, AC. The side length of this triangle is P, AC is P. Let the base be Q and let the hypotenuse be H. Same notation like we had in our question, right? Now, if you actually notice something, this side, BE, or rather the vector BE is actually minus A, right? Because here you have this A vector. And if you take it the other way around, We'll get minus a vector right similarly bg all bgb it will be minus b it will clearly be minus b because again if b is towards this side then if you extend it to the other way you get minus b over here and similarly similarly cd will be what minus c vector because again c vector is in this direction so minus c vector will be right in the opposite direction so this will be equal to minus c look something like this yeah Okay, so we have minus a minus b minus c and then now we're going to apply the simple rule that sum of squares of the diagonals is equal to sum of squares of the side. Now, let's start in parallelogram a, b, c, d in parallelogram a, b, c, d sum of squares of the diagonals. Now, what is the sum of squares of the diagonals? P is one diagonal and minus c is the other diagonal. So you'll get p squared plus c squared as the sum of squares of the diagonals and sides we have a as one of the sides and we have b as the other side so you'll get two times a squared plus b squared so this is the first equation and let me just call this number two right or let's just demonstrate that as something else maybe a you know cool now in parallelogram b f e c so let's, let's just analyze b f e c over here now b f e c the second parallelogram that i drawn the diagonals are q and minus a so sum of squares of the diagonals is q squared plus a squared and the sides, the sides are C and B, right? So you'll get two times B squared plus C squared over here. Now, in parallelogram, the third one, what was the third one? It was A, G, F, B. In parallelogram, A, G, F, B, the third one, the third one that I've drawn, the diagonals are H and minus B, right? So you get H squared plus B squared. And then you'll have the sum of squares of the sides. And sides over here are A and C. So you will have two times a squared plus c squared. Let me just label this equation. Let's say this is b and let's say this is c. And so this is a, this is b, this is c. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add all of three together. So add a plus b plus c and um, you will get p squared plus q squared over here plus 8 squared. So p squared plus q squared plus 8 squared plus you will also get... Um, c squared plus a squared plus b squared or rather a squared plus b squared plus c squared and on the right hand side you will have you will have you add up all of these three quantities and you will indeed get um four times a squared plus b squared plus c squared right it'll be something like that so basically p squared plus q squared this is equal to eight square you know because it's a it's a right angle triangle right p squared plus q squared is equal to eight square don't forget that Pythagoras theorem applies here also, right? Now, 8 squared plus 8 squared becomes 2 8 squared. And that is obviously 3 times a squared plus b squared plus c squared. Now, it's clear to see that 8 squared is 3 by 2 times a squared plus b squared plus c squared. Or half more than a squared plus b squared plus c squared. 50% more than a squared plus b squared plus c squared. Just put in 250, you get 8 squared as 375. And I think that's probably the best solution to this problem. It does justice. 
to this beautiful looking problem over here. So I, I hope you really enjoyed that. You know, we looked at three solutions. First one was a quick fix, solving it in two, three minutes. And that is what I would probably do as well on the exam because I need to solve as many questions as possible in the minimum amount of time. But if it was a subjective exam, both algebraic and this beautiful uh, geometric solution work beautifully. And the third one, I really liked it because it's very elegant and it uses a little bit of geometry and vectors and complex numbers. And uh, that's what makes it brilliant. We're using so many areas of mathematics over here. And I hope you enjoyed it as well. Okay, so we have some book suggestions for USAMO, JMO, or Amy. Elementary number three by David Burton. Problem solving strategies by Arthur and Jell. Functional equation by Venkatachala. Problems in plain geometry by Sharigan. Elementary number three by Sierpinski. Graph theory by Harari. And combinatorix by Brualdi. So at the end, we have similar but challenging problem. And I want you to find the locus of all numbers in the complex plane satisfying this given condition. Z plus Z bar is equal to A times modulus of Z, where A is a real number. So maybe try this out. And if you're able to do it, let me know. Until then, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Chinta programs are designed for students who are passionate about mathematics. And they are personalized with one-on-one -on -one training, individual evaluation, and remedial sessions. The reason Chinta students are successful over the last 10 years because they are taught by mathematicians and real Olympiads from leading universities in India, United States and Europe. Some of our students come back to teach at Chinta from Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, MIT, UCLA, ISI, CMI, IITs, TIFR and IISC. For more information, visit chitta.com.